Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Saurabh Agarwal. I'm upper limb surgeon at Princess Royal Hospital. Uh, and I thank you for your time. And thank you by us for this uh, gr uh, great opportunity. My topic today is uh, elbow anatomy and approaches for the FRCS auth exams. Now in exams, either you will have to bring an approach as part of your answer, or at some stage, the examiner may show you a pro section or a slide uh, with the approach and ask you to describe it. So let's start with the dynamic stabilizers, extensor muscles, four, origin, lateral epicondyle, their names, ECU, EDM, EDC, and ECRB. And then flexors, again, four muscles, origin, medial epicondyle. And the easiest way to remember is uh, if you put your palm with your four fingers. So your index finger is pronator teres followed by FCR, palmaris longer, longus, and your little finger is a uh, flexor carpi ulnaris. And then looking at the static stabilizers, so you've got a lateral ligament, which is comprised of radial collateral ligament, annular ligament, and lateral ulnar collateral ligament. Now, origin is just below lateral epicondyle, sort of posterior aspect. And then LUCL sits on the supinator crest of ulna. And this ligament is important because if it's not repaired properly or doesn't heal properly, it can give rise to posterolateral rotatory instability. On the medial side, again, there are three limbs to uh, medial collateral ligament. Most important is your anterior band of MCL. So the origin is just below, like antero inferior to the medial epicondyle. And then this anterior band will sit on sublime tubercle at the anteromedial facet. And then of course, there's a horizontal band and there's a posterior uh, part to it. So now talking about approaches, so lateral approach, we're gonna talk about caucus, modified caucus, EDC split, and Keplon. But I would say for exam purposes, you learn one approach, the one you've seen with your consultants, and then you can talk about it confidently. Of course, in practical life, every approach has a use. But for exam purposes, one approach. Then of course, with every approach, you need to talk about internervous plane, bony landmarks, positioning, clean and drape and who list, and then of course, consent is important uh, and mention one or two risks, especially the nerve relevant to that approach. Now for sake of time, I'm not gonna repeat this for every approach, but it is implied. So Cocker's approach, internervous plane is Anconius and ECU. So if I show you how I do it, so I would always mark Anconius uh, every time I do a Cocker's or any uh, lateral approach. So bony landmarks, epicondyle, lateral epicondyle for E, O for olecranon, mark a point six centimeters distal to olecranon, and then join these dots. So this triangle, what you get uh, is your anconius muscle. So if I cut on this line, I'm going between anconius and ECU, which is what I've shown here. So once you raise two nice flaps, then uh, you come across fascia, Unlike your medial side, on the lateral side, fascia is quite thick and stout. So you incise it as a separate layer, then repair it in the end to prevent muscle herniation. Then inside will be your internervous plane. So you put your thumb on a radial head, rotate it, make sure you're on radial head, cut at equator or in front, and then it will take you right inside. Now, in this case, I was just doing a radial head uh, sort of replacement. So very comminuted radial head, I decided to replace it. Some transosseous stitches for your LUCL repair. So the Cocker's approach can be used for radial head fixation or replacement, can be used even for terrible triads, which Mr. Fudness will tell you in a lot more details, for arthrotomies, for septic arthritis. Then, uh, so if I now bring your attention to this picture, so Cocker's is this one, where I'm pointing with my arrow. Now, remember with Cocker's, sorry, uh, 
if you see, we are going right in plane of LUCL. So we're going to cut LUCL in line of the ligament, but as we repair, as we close the wound, ligament tends to heal up and doesn't give PLRI. But imagine in a terrible triad situation, LUCL in 95% cases would have come off the epicondyle and then we are cutting in line also. So it's double jeopardy if you like. So in those cases, you can do a modified caucus. So incision in the same plane, but inside, if you cut the muscles further anterior, so that way you have preserved your LUCL as I've shown you in this picture. So that's your modified caucus. Or you can do a EDC split. So this paper compared EDC split with caucus. And again, if you see the picture on the left, this is your caucus where you can see posterior radial head. If I go further anterior, that's my EDC split where I'll see anterior half of radial head. Now, remember radial head fractures, Mason's classification, 80% are in the anterior part of radial head. So it makes sense to do a EDC split in those cases rather than a caucus. And then of course, when I'm anterior, when I'm anterior, I am not, uh, I'm preserving, not damaging my lateral ulna collateral ligament. Of course, the trade-off is you are getting closer and closer to your posterior interosseous nerve. So again, some indications, some uses. So terrible triad, you can do your EDC splits, capitulum fractures, even septic arthritis, uh, isolated radial heads. Now, so for example, this case, terrible triad, Again, I'll not say a lot. I'll leave it to Mr. Fudness. But, but if you see, I have again drawn my anconius. So if you see this triangle, so this line, if I had cut on this line, it would have been a caucus approach, but I've gone a bit in the front. So I've done an EDC split, an extended EDC split. And then once radial head comes out, I can address my capsule with my retrograde sutures, replace the radial head, and then an anchor in the isometric point of your uh, lateral ligaments. Why is this an extended approach? Because if you see, I've taken off brachialis in the front, triceps behind. Again, capitulum, same, you do an extended approach and then hold your capitulum with temporary wires, retrograde or anti-grade uh, screws, headless screws, bury them. Kaplan's approach will be further anterior to EDC. So again, if you see this picture on the right, that's our caucus between ECU and Anconius. Now here we have gone between EDC and ECRB, so further anterior. But as we were saying before, trade-off is you're very close to posterior interosseous nerve. And then if you see this paper, which looked at your anti, your post, sorry, I beg your pardon, it's posterior interosseous nerve, which comes into play in your postrolateral approaches, especially the anterior ones. So what they found was, uh, if you see the picture here, the nerve around five centimeters from the top of the radial head will give its first muscular branches to ECU. Uh, there are other papers, if you read, which will even talk about nerve further proximal. So some papers will say the nerve is around two and a half centimeters. But as you pronate, which is what we should do in a postulatal approach, nerve goes distal and further away. And the excursion is one centimeter. So from two and a half, it will be three and a half. So up to three and a half, you're quite safe, which is roughly the level of bicipital gibrosity. In practical terms for exams and what I do in my practice, roughly from the radial head, I'll measure three centimeters. And I know for sure that in three centimeters, I'm not going to damage my pin. And which is what they concluded here, that fully pronate the forearm. If you have to release supinator for some reason, it should be from the supinator crest. Now, this is important. Subperiostal elevation of supinator is not safe. So we know nerve travels between the two heads of supinator, but at some places, nerve is almost touching the bone. It's not between the two heads. So all, if you have to, then dissect the nerve, see the nerve first, then elevate 
or do a superior oscillar elevation of supinator. And of course, if you go through Pocker's interval, you are away from the nerve. So, so we've seen four approaches. We've seen a bit of anatomy of pin nerve, the indications, and how to prevent damage to the nerve. So for exam purposes, pick up one approach, very thorough with the anatomy of pin, the excursion of pin, the importance of pronation. Bring that as part of your consenting as, uh, and as part of your discussion. Now coming to medial approaches, again, three approaches, Hotchkiss, Ring and Taylor. Now we know there are four flexors. Uh, for exam purposes, again, pick up one approach. I would say a ring approach, uh, but we'll discuss all three. Uh, Hotchkiss is your 50-50 approach or over the top approach. 50 means you divide your four muscles half and half. So if you go between FCR and Palmaris longus, that's your Hotchkiss approach. And I've shown all those four flexors here also. Now, because medial approach will involve looking at the ulnar nerve. So let's see the ulnar nerve first. A few important points about ulnar nerve. First, best place to identify ulnar nerve is at three to four centimeters proximal to epicondyle, next to uh, medial triceps, especially in revision situations. Once you identify it, then look for Osborne's ligament, put a McDonald's as you would do for your carpal tunnel uh, release, and then incise it with a knife or a scissor. Uh, then look at the intermuscular septum, and uh, especially in a situation where you want to transpose your nerve anteriorly, it is very important not just to divide it, but to excise the whole in medial intermuscular septum. Because if we do not do that, then in an anterior transposition situation, nerve can flick over this septum. It can irritate the nerve post operatively. And then of course, divide your two heads of FCU, be aware of the muscular branch to it. And finally, uh, always look at the nerve. Is it hypervascular, hypervascular, atrophied, hypertrophied, how is it and make make a comment in your notes. And then, yes, of course, look for the anti-brachial cutaneous nerve. So Hotchkiss approach we have talked, spoken about between FCR and Palmaris longus. Now for exam purposes, I would say learn this approach, ring approach, David Ring, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, it's an FCU split approach. And we've all done a learn of decompressions. So easy to memorize. Again, of course, you'll be talking about your consents and your positionings and your bony landmarks, your who list. So in this case, what I've done is, so white arrow will show you your, again, it was a terrible triad case. So white arrow shows the ulnar nerve, two yellow arrowhead shows the FCU, two heads of FCU. And on the right operative picture, the violet arrow shows the ulnar nerve. So I've decompressed it. Part of FCU there, part of FCU below. And then, so once I've gone through the bed of FCU, through the, through the bed of ulnar nerve, sorry, and decompressed it, the next step is to go through the capsule. And in this case, before the capsule, sorry, because it was a slightly difficult sort of a case, I have divided the flexor muscles. So these two yellow arrowheads, if you see the circle, this is your whole flexor mass which comprises pronator teres, FCR, Pomaris longus, and the anterior half of FCU. And here I've left a little cuff for me to stitch it back. Once I have done the flexor mass and I've incised the capsule, I'm straight onto my anterior band of MCL, which was torn here as shown, held in the forceps. And there was a facet fracture, anteromedial facet fracture. And then, of course, you can do your screws or plates and repair your anterior band of MCL. So FCU split approach, I would say one approach and bring it out for discussion for those uh, terrible trials. Of course, Mr. Fudness will tell us in a lot more detail about them. So this was the case, x-rays corresponding 3D CT. 3D CT, very important. That's your anteromedial facet. Uh, MCL has pulled it. So we've done a medial approach. And once I'm there, I've repaired it. 
Uh, of course, this is a different case to the pictures that I've shown because here anterior band of MCL is intact. So separate case, sorry, beg your pardon. So I've repaired my uh, anteromedial facet. I've repaired my capsule with two retrograde drills. And then finally a small incision on the lateral side to repair my uh, lateral ligament, LUCL especially. Taylor and Sham, again, uh, in this, all we do is we lift the whole flexor mass anteriorly. So again, see your nerve, lift it off. And indication for these is if you have a coronoid fracture, which extends right down to olecranon. Anterior approach. I'm sorry, it's a very busy slide, but you can read it at your leisure. This will be brought in discussion in exams in a case of displaced supracondylar fracture, where the spike of the anterior fragment has gone through and severed brachial artery. So of course you will liaise with your vascular surgeons and then uh, patient is supine, arm bow, tunique and sort of, so your incision is a lazy S, uh, distally it's on the lateral side, it curves across the elbow crease and goes medially. Skin and fat flaps, bicipital aponeurosis, we know it protects your brachial artery and medial nerve. As, as we divide it, you're looking straight at your brachial artery and medial nerve. And then you can tag your brachial artery and then send the patient back to vascular surgeons after reducing the fracture and K-wiring it. Uh, of course, if I further take you through pictures D and E, if you're shown a trochlear fracture or an anterolateral facet fracture, you can, or some surgeons would like to do them through this approach. So for that, you take brachial artery to one side, median to another, go through, elevate brachialis, incise the capsule. And as seen here, a trochlear fracture, you're looking straight at your trochlea and your anterolateral facet. So for those two cases, you can discuss this approach. Posterior approach. Now, olecranon osteotomy approach or trap flap approach, important because this is what we do routinely also. So indications would be those distal humerus intra-articular fractures uh, as shown here. So again, positioning, I do it in lateral. Some people would do it in supine. If you know your plates are not gonna go that high up, almost always you can use a tunique, uh, do your whole list. And then after raising your flaps, you see your ulnar nerve, as we have spoken before and shown here in blue sling, then olecranon and osteotomy. So put a plate, pre-drill your holes, plate comes off, chevron osteotomy, start with a saw, complete the cut with an osteotome to prevent any cartilage damage. And as we have shown here, take, or, take your triceps and stitch it proximally. Uh, and then, because this fracture was very comminuted, you can, you are allowed use of K wires temporarily. You are even allowed threaded wires uh, to hold very tiny fragments if the need arises, or even some free screws, even though we should minimize as much as possible. And then of course, I have here put two double plating, parallel plate as advocated by Mayo Clinic. But Mr. Singh, my colleague will then tell us later today uh, about parallel versus perpendicular plating, their indications, advantages, disadvantages. And then of course, on this picture, uh, once I've done my two plates, I've reattached my, or repaired my olecranon with a plate. And this fellow, this muscle here is anconius. So I had taken anconius and triceps together. Triceps, anconius, pedicle flap. And the reason for that is the nerve to anconius is given off in the spiral groove. And then it comes from proximally all the way down. So by taking anconius with triceps, I preserve the nerve supply and even the vascularity to this muscle. So you can bring that into your discussion. Then Boyd interval approach. Again, uh, indications would be you can address your isolated radial head fractures, even terrible triads, and then Montegia fracture dislocations. I would do it in a lateral. Some people may want to do it in supine. So bring that up in your discussions. 
along with your consents and boonie landmarks and uh, who list. Uh, and then again, uh, make nice skin fat flaps. That's your fascia. Again, you incise it and leave a couple of mil mils here, two, three mils, so that you can use this fascia to attach to anconius. And then this is, this is the anconius muscle. Take it proximally, stitch it. And then as you take off your annular ligament, which is in continuation with LUCL, which is what I'm tracing with my arrow, as you take it off from supinator crest, that's your crest, that little round hump, you will start seeing the radial head, which is what I find pointed with red arrow, supinator crest, black arrow, violet arrow is all this LUCL and LCL rather. So then you can work on your radial heads. You can put a plate on the ulna in Montegia fracture dislocations. You can extend this incision proximally and you will start seeing your LCL and MCL, so terrible triads. Uh, and then uh, once you've done your Montegias and your radial heads, to stitch your LUCL back, which is what I've shown with yellow arrows, all this structure there, uh, you do transosseous drills in the supinator crest, three drills, so three sutures, and this is the repair. Uh, and again, paper Robinson and uh, Lee Van Ransburg wrote about it. It's a very good paper. Those of you who have time for exams can sort of have a look at it. And then uh, finally, last posterior approach, the lateral para olecranon approach. Again, a very nice paper from Graham King from Canada. Now, indications for this is you can, so it's a triceps on approach you leave the triceps onto olecranon. So you're preserving all the strength and post-operatively you can mobilize patient early. So triceps on approach. It can be used for your total elbow replacements, can be used for distal humerus, very comminuted intra-articular fractures where you're not sure if you are able to fix it or do you have to replace it on table. So you don't want to do an olecranon osteotomy. And then finally, the distal humerus articular surface fractures, where you have involvement of capitulum and trochlea with anterior and posterior combination, where again, you do not know if you can fix it or you may have to replace it in those very rare cases. So again, just to break it into simple steps, lateral position, see the ulnar nerve after making flaps, anconius, take this incision up, and you split the triceps, but one third lateral triceps will come with anconius. So if you see the picture here, the two third, two, medial two third of your triceps, which is your main triceps, sorry, stays on to olecranon. Uh, so you're preserving it. It's a triceps on approach. And then of course, you can see on the picture here with the knife, ulnar nerve, medial side, they are releasing MCL and flexors. Then on the lateral side, you can release extensors and LCL. So once we have released all the ligaments, uh, now it's very easy to uh, sort of uh, bring humerus or ulna into the wound, and you can prepare both and do your elbow replacements or your distal humerus fixation in your intraarticular fractures or articular surface fractures. So this is what they have shown here. They've done an elbow replacement and triceps is still intact. So you can start early rehabilitation. So I think this is the last slide. This is the paper which we wrote earlier last year where I have put a lot of my operative pictures and spoken about surgical approaches to elbow. So again, if some of you want to have a look, uh, I hope it will benefit. And I've taken a paragraph from my paper and put it here because lateral para, para olecranon approach is not uh, done very frequently. So hopefully it will make it easier for you, uh, all of you to understand. And I think that is the end of my lecture. This is my website. And on the menu bar, I have my YouTube channel where there are lots of lectures for FRCS auth exams, if some of you want to have a look. Uh, thank you uh, for your very kind attention. Uh, thank you.